स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया So TensorFlow One was heavily uh, based on uh, making graphs and then uh, introducing the lazy execution of the graphs, which mostly, if you uh, have followed the distributed programming of Spark, that is kind of same uh, program paradigm. But in TensorFlow Two, uh, that that program paradigm of lazy execution has been transferred to your Uh, eager execution. Okay, so eager execution means as soon as you define something or any operation you define, it will be evaluated in the in, in instant. Okay, so that is completely opposite of your lazy execution that was followed in TensorFlow one and subsequent versions. So from the TensorFlow two, we have eager execution, and uh, uh, from the structural point of view, uh, TensorFlow one was a bit difficult to follow if you are uh coming from a uh, completely python background and uh, py tensorflow 2 is more uh, a pythonic approach and and uh, it can be very suitable for beginners to experts because different levels of programming is there which you for you can follow to define your uh, particular model that that you want to train uh now <clears throat> Uh, so if you see the structure or, or architecture of tensorflow so basically the tensorflow architecture has three main blocks uh, one is the training block as it is the save and repository block in the middle you can see here and the right hand side you can see the deployment block so all these three blocks which have been introduced uh, in 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 2.0 and and subsequent versions this made the life much easier for the development and deployment of uh, deep learning algorithms seamlessly okay so in the training module you see that we have distributed training strategy core so which is written in c++ and that supports uh, cpu gpu tpu execution and and of course multi node cpu multi node gpu multi node tpu so all these kind of combinations that supports and for defining the model itself you have high level apis as keyers and estimators but it is recommended that you don't est use estimators nowadays keyers implemented from tensorflow so keyers has two implementations one is native impl implementation so if you are using keyers io and there is another implementation from tensorflow itself and which we will use for de defining our models and most of the uh uh tf2 or tensorflow 2 versions uh, are very very compatible and efficient uh with this high level api defined by the keyers now we also have data design uh, modules as uh, tf dot data and tf data sets so now this data design in tensorflow is bit different from that you have seen in pytorch in the previous sections so that also we will talk about and 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 there are much more flexibility in terms of data access because the data sets are uh, all the necessary modules that that are actually designed by the tensorflow mod uh, designers itself so all the data that are imported by this uh, data tf dot data will have the flexibility to directly convert into tensors which is the main data structure in tensorflow and and use it subsequently so in the inter pipeline you do not need to convert it into the tensors and and deliver to your uh, gpu or tp right so in terms of flexibility this tf dot data adds one more level of uh, flexibility and efficiency uh, while you are accessing data there is this analysis or visualization uh, tool which is also available uh, in in pytorch Uh, plugin that we have seen so far in the previous classes, and also we here also TensorBoard is available with TensorFlow. Uh, TensorBoard is available with TensorFlow packages. 
Now for the saving model, we have the serialization and saving model. So if you can save your model instantly and reuse it. And also there is TensorFlow Hub. So TensorFlow Hub is model repository. So if you want to use already trained models, which are already trained with defined parameters, you can use those parameters, you can tune them in your training, depending on the, the target model that you are targeting and the target uh, problem that you are targeting. So basically, if you are targeting classification problem, depending on the number of classes that is available, you can tune the already existing parameters from the TensorFlow hub. Now, the deployment part is completely uh, giving the TensorFlow a new dimension. So the models that you have defined or trained or, or, or designed inside the TensorFlow modules, you can seamlessly convert it or deploy it on, onto your cloud based on browser. So if you are uh, using browser, you can deploy browser with using tensorflow.js. If you are like, trying to deploy your models for Android devices or iOS devices or Raspberry Pi, or even Android, uh, Arduino support, the, it has with TensorFlow Lite Micro. So TensorFlow Lite and TensorFlow Lite Micro will have, uh, you, you, you need to use just to uh, save, uh, uh, just to use your saved models and convert to the targeted uh, ways. Now for the target cloud platform, you can use TensorFlow Serving, right? So all these deployment strategies are, are, are inbuilt. So different strategies there are, and we will see how to use them. So all these three stacks make uh, actually the, the TensorFlow a bit uh, flexible and, and, and flexible for product development and, and product oriented projects, right? So now the workflow is similar to that of your PyTorch. So you have to uh, feature your data and, and feature engineer your data, uh, transform or whatever you want to uh, normalize your data. So all these things you will do in the beginning. And then you have to define the model, build the model. So as I was mentioning that you can use Keras uh, uh, pre-made estimators. So these estimators, as I was mentioning, that it is not recommended for the newer versions of TensorFlow 2. Uh, after TensorFlow 2.5, actually it is not recommended. And also you can use uh, some APIs to uh, custom build your models. So KS is having all the models, mostly 90% of the models that are necessary to build your models. And if you want to go a bit more flexible and, and, and to have more control over model building, you can use this custom uh, models uh, building APIs, right? And then in the training, uh, training stage of this pipeline, you have this eager exhibition as well as autographs. So this autograph will uh, give you the efficiency of the graph-based approaches of TensorFlow 1. Okay, so, so once you, one way you have the eager execution, which is, uh, which is uh, actually the instant evaluation. So in compile time itself, you will see what kind of errors are there and, and, and you can evaluate your model depending on the definition that you have defined. And you can use autograph to, to enhance the performance of the model in the subsequent runs. Okay. So we will see how to define all these uh, uh, explicit uh, APIs to be used to enhance the efficiency. Distribution strategy, as I was mentioning, that distribution strategy was written in score C++, and that gives it much more flexibility in terms of distributing the, the data parallelism, uh, model parallelism, as well as uh, the pipeline values. And of course, Tensor, TensorBoard is, is in build tool, which you will use for visualize and, and analyze your model and, and give it much more boost in the, in the subsequent runs. And in the end, you save the model and, and use it for deploy, right? So as I was mentioning that, uh, what why we are actually moving towards the 2.x version is that the Keras, which is uh, the newer implementation from the TensorFlow, and the eager execution. And this eager execution is, is highly efficient uh, from the Pythonic approach of programming. So in PyTorch, you have seen some, 
And in TensorFlow 2 uh, and, and subsequent versions, we will see much more of that eager execution. So this is just, just to have a look of the of the entire model that you have defined in, in compile time, right? And also robust model deployment. So deployment, that third stack you have seen, it is it is uh, actually uh, giving you the, the extra boost to use it over PyTorch. Okay? Powerful experimentation for research. So for researchers, there is some custom APIs that, it, that, that they can use to uh, build or define the models from the scratch itself. So that is also uh, a similar to PyTorch. So whatever we have seen that we will discuss in the subsequent slides. Now you have this uh, deprecation of APIs because more, many of the APIs that you are, if you are coming from your TensorFlow 1 code to your TensorFlow 2 code, many of the APIs have been de deprecated and cleaning or, or clean up your code uh, is very easy uh, with, with, with uh, clean up, cleaning up APIs. And uh, here dot data, as I was mentioning that loading data is giving another dimension because uh, there are many APIs in TF which is defined to distribute uh, the data of which you are loading the, to, to have uh, prefetching options, to have pipeline parallelism options, also to have cache options, whether you want to store your prefetched data into your RAM or your disk. So all these APIs are already built into tf.data. tf.keras uh, that I just mentioned that you can build the models with, with Keras API, high-level API. TensorFlow Hub, which is the uh, uh, already saved uh, already set the models and, and parameters that you can get from. Also, uh, run and debug with eager execution debugging also is very, very much possible with, with some one or two lines of code addition. Now, as I was mentioning that it is uh, highly efficient to, uh, to run in CPUs, GPUs, TPUs, and, and distribution strategies is uh, it's much more flexible and, and you can customize the distribution strategy. Uh, we will we'll spend most, uh, I think, maybe 50% of the time in the next class to discuss this distribution strategy. Okay? And exporting saved models, usually this will help you to deploy efficiently using TensorFlow.js or, or TensorFlow Lite or TensorFlow Lite Micro, depending on the target environment that you are targeting. And TensorFlow datasets, already it has numerous datasets that you want for your uh, model training. Uh, most of the problems uh, targeting, if you are targeting, let's say, classification, you are uh, targeting computer vision problems, NLP problems, uh, even, even segmentation or, or multi-stage uh, 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 definition of, let's say, uh, segmentation and, and captioning of videos. So different data sets are available to give you much more flexibility to use this tf.data uh, APIs to be used with the data sets that is already available. So now we will come to the model building. The so model building part, as I was mentioning, that is uh, uh, giving you the options to start with for beginners. So as you can see here, from the left side, you have beginners to the experts on the right side. And for the beginners, defining simple models, okay, uh, it is very easy to use sequential APIs. Okay? So there are several APIs that, that is available in TensorFlow, as I was mentioning, that it is to give you flexibility and control. So uh, this, this API, if you are using sequential API, most of the models you can build with this sequential API because this API has all the built-in layers okay, that you can reuse and, and you can define. And you can use to define your simple models. Next stage, if you are, let's say, an engineer with standard use cases and you want to use uh, uh, the built-in layers of functional API, so basically, uh, if you see the sequential API, the sequential API will give you uh, 
the platform to define one model which has one input and one output. Okay? Of course, that input and output is multidimensional. No need to mention that. But the functional API has the flexibility to, now you will see that the flexibility is increasing step by step in, in, in the APIs that we are going on the right side, right? So now it has the improved flexibility to add, of course, the built-in layers that you will use. But now you will have the option to define multiple inputs and multiple outputs. And also those inputs and outputs can be at several stages. You can merge them. You can use to branch them. Or you can define your model using multiple inputs and outputs depending on which stage you are using. So as you can see, sequential API, simple models for beginners, functional API for built-in uh, layers you will use, but you can define the multiple inputs and outputs. Now, if you go to have much more control over this functional API, you can have functional API plus custom layers, plus custom metrics, plus custom losses. So metrics, losses, these are essentially very important or crucial parameters that you want to track while training your model, right? Now, you can define custom metrics, which metrics you want to track. Most of the metrics that you use, as we have seen in the last uh, Catalyst class, so all the metrics uh, were actually defined in, the, in, in that framework, as well as in TensorFlow 2.0, We'll have many metrics that is already available. You can define custom metrics as well, custom losses, and define custom layers used with functional API. So functional API is essentially call the layers as functions. So the entire sequential API will give you the stack of layers. So this is completely one data structure. In the functional API, you will have this, the, 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 the graph of, of the built-in layers and you can call them. Okay, so so the layers are callable now. And in subclassing, this is completely uh, relevant if you are coming from PyTorch. So subclassing is same as programming from scratch, whatever you have done in PyTorch. Okay. Now you can say that why we need functional API again, right? We can do it from scratch. We can either use for simple models with sequential API, then why we need functional API. But functional API has much more to it than you are seeing here. Okay, so we will discuss how we can actually define one model in using functional API very, very efficiently, uh, not going for sequential and, and why you will not go for subclass. Okay. Now, this sequential way of defining so there are two programming paradigms that is supported in tensorflow that i mentioned in the first slide itself so tensor is essentially the data structure and the flow is essentially the graph computational graph that you want to execute now uh, from tensorflow 2 we have this uh, symbolic api so which is keras sequential api that you will use to define where well, your model is a graph of layers and any graph you can compile will work. And TensorFlow helps you to debug by catching errors at compile time itself because it is supporting the Jaeger execution, not the lazy execution, which was uh, in, in TensorFlow 1. Now in the uh, imperative API, so subclassing is imperative API. So this is kind of object oriented programming style are defining, defining your models and using them. So in that subclassing, your model is essentially converted into your Python bytecode. And you will have much more control over the models that you are defining. And, and since it, it is completely customized according to your requirement, it is a bit difficult to debug. But of course, the, if you know the ways to debug, it, it is not that hard. Now the training part. So model defining, as you have seen, there are four kind of approaches or ways you can define it. 
and training the model also is kind of tricky if you are coming from pytorch so model.fit this function is for quick expect you just call the forward function and it will do automatic gradient descent calculating the gradients updating the weight parameters and biases so all these things will be completely automated just call the fit model over the model or fit function over the model that's it. now callbacks so callbacks you have seen in the previous class also in the catalyst so that same notion is also here you can use callbacks you can customize your training loop by adding checkpoints early stopping you can have tensor board monitoring slack notifications so 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 this is quite, quite interesting you can you can define your model you can now start the training hit the training with callbacks you can define one callback which will give you slack notification for each uh, let's say epoch are done okay so for each epoch what is the metric status or, or status of your training it will give you notification so you can all add all these callbacks in inside here so you can see model.fit is just simple way of training the, the vanilla way of training or, or maybe automated completely automated in the callbacks you can add checkpointing early stopping so all these uh, customizations you can add now model dot train on batch so this method plus callbacks so you can now customize the training loop also so customizing training loop with train on batch because training loop has several options batch optimizers which loss function you are using so all these are actually automated here in this fit functions train on batch plus callbacks if you use you can customize your optimizer you can customize your losses you can customize your entire training loop actually and and completely scratch uh, development of your training loop also you can do with custom training so here with gradient tape so this is a very simple api which keeps track of all the parameters which are differentiable okay so using this gradient tip we will see uh, how to program with gradient tip so we using gradient tip you can customize or, or completely write your training uh, module or training loop from scratch so optimizations modifying gradients how you want to define your loss function so loss function as i've mentioned so different loss functions are there mhc loss cross entropy loss right now if you want to define your own loss function you can use custom training loop with gradient tip where you can define your functions for your loss functions and you can call that function inside gradient tip to be uh, accounted for your uh, optimizing now as uh, uh, this is the basic of tensorflow so tensor data type so tensor data type is uh, you have seen also in pytorch tensors definition of tensors right but tensors in in in, in tensorflow is is uh, similar it has few features uh, different from pytorch tensors but it is completely same as your numpy n it is exactly same however you have defined your multi dimensional simple single dimensional array in numpy it is the same uh, way of definition same way of function calling same way of slicing so everything you can use exactly same in tensor in tensorflow so tensor data type has a name and type and a rank so type is essentially the data type rank is uh, essentially uh, how many elements it has and a shape so the name identifies uniquely the object which you want to use in your computational graph the computational graph means so if you recall the computational graph from the uh, first pytorch class you have let's say a tensor you, you have uh, let's say weight tensor w you have your tensor input as x so w into x if you are doing so that is one uh, flow of operation so this data is 
spread into the multiplication operation. So that is simple flow of data. And, and this flow of data is represented in computational graph. Now in computational graph, if you have what kind of data type you are using as tensors. So these are tensors, the input tensor, the weight tensor, the bias tensor. So all these are tensors and what data type you are using there. Now it has lot of support for data. That's float 32, int 8, int 32, float 16. You can look into TensorFlow's website, tensorflow.org to get more of these data types. What are the data types that are available? and how you can define uh, your, your tensors for a particular data. Rank is simply the number of dimensions of the tensor. So basically, scalar means it has one element, so rank is zero. Vector has rank one, so basically one dimension it has, right? The shape is the number of elements in each dimension. So let's say rank two tensor, so two dimensions are there. Now in each dimension, how many elements will be there? So that will be defined by the shape. So let's say a vector of shape D0. So basically D0 is the number of elements. Mat matrix of shape D0, D1. So D0 is the elements, number of elements in the first dimension. Maybe it row and, and column, let's say D1. So how many elements? Are there? So as simple as that. And the dimensions, uh, no, none. So there can be none also as dimension. Okay? And none is allowed and, and it indicates unknown dimension. Because in some of the programming uh, of models, you will be using some tensors where you do not know how many batches will come or, or how many output of uh, uh, in particular dimension, first, first dimension, how many elements will be given as output? So you do not know in, 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 let's say, defining time of your model, you can use none in those places. Okay, next we will see the different types of tensors. So there are some immutable tensors, there are mutable tensors. So immutable tensors means you cannot change their values like constants. So tf dot constants will be used to define constant tensors. You can define variable tensors, but remember that tf dot variable which you are defining, but v is capital V. This is just uh, the notion that TensorFlow uses, but for the constants, c is small. So variables, the data uh, that you are defining tensor as, you can change their values, okay? But most of the trainings, you do not need to worry about that. You do not need to define your tensors as low level as variable or, or constants. If you are starting with sequential uh, or even functional level, if you are defining your tensors from scratch, without using your TensorFlow data type tf.data, you can use these variable definitions for constants and variables. But most of the time you will not use them, okay? But it is nice to know. Uh, and now this tf.data, as I was mentioning that tf.data is, is much more flexible in terms of data loading and how it is. So we'll just see a few examples then because this is just to show you the flexibility, how to define that. But we will use them explicitly and define how to define your TensorFlow uh, data sets, uh, TensorFlow data loaders, uh, which actually storing the data, not such data loaders that you have seen in PyTorch. Now, here as data set you can use, also you can use TensorFlow data sets. So I, I mentioned that Keras has its own implementation and Keras has its TensorFlow implementation. In our cases, we'll use Keras TensorFlow implementation. And of course, Keras TensorFlow, TensorFlow.Keras has lots of data sets available. Now, the, if you are importing data sets from Keras, it is different if you are importing data sets from TensorFlow data sets. So tf.data, so tfds, if you are using tfds, that is different. 
and if you are using KLS dataset, that is different because TensorFlow datasets are already tensors. You do not need to uh, you do not need to convert them or transfer them for your GPU or TPU which you are using. And for your KLS datasets, it is not the tensors. Actually, they will be imported as data sets as as or, or NumPy uh, data structures. Now, if you are using TensorFlow data sets, you will have the flexibility to define the flag in memory true or false because TFDS can load your data into your memory, in, into your RAM to, to give you uh, uh, much more uh, easy and and faster access okay, to, to the data. Let's say you, you are trying your data to be processed by CPU and, and if you are using Keras data set, then you are actually defining to be stored into the disk. You then load into the RAM and here you directly load into the RAM as tensors and, and you there you go. Yeah. You can cache as well by using dot cache uh, function. Now cache, you can cache your data set, which you are, you are mapping for your, uh, let's say for this pre-process function. So let's say I want some images, some image classification problem I'm trying to address where I need to pre-process the image data before applying them into uh, the models. Now these pre-process uh, function will be used several times depending on the number of batches or number of images that you are using inside your model. Now, if you are having this pre-process inside, I don't know where, you need to access that many times, you need to call them, right? Now you have the flexibility to cache it inside RAM or disk, depending on, let's say you are trying to cache anything as file inside your disk or cache anything inside your RAM, you can do that. And here we are uh, using map function to actually map this pre-process uh, with this many number of parallel calls uh, with, with cache, uh, cached version inside your RAM, yeah, directly. So that is also possible with with uh, ImageDS, which is the uh, TF.dataset, right? 